John was born Angela Roncalli in 1881. He was the third of 13 kids. And he used to always talk about his, uh, his peasant background. Um, he had this wonderful sense of humility that uh, he kept all throughout his life. And uh, he was very funny and very humble. But to think of him as this kind of jolly papal Santa Claus is to do him a real disservice. Um, he was a very uh, able diplomat. He had spent many years in the Vatican Diplomatic Corps. He was uh, the papal nuncio or ambassador to Bulgaria and Turkey. And finally, uh, he was Archbishop of Venice. Um, and he wrote a note to his sister saying, who wants to be more than Archbishop of Venice? Um, but during the conclave in 1958, the papal conclave, he was elected uh, pope. And many people thought John would be a sort of transitional pope, just kind of bridging one era to another. But he was a very important man in the Catholic Church, especially in the 20th century, because he called the Second Vatican Council. John had said that uh, the Second Vatican Council didn't come as a, a long, uh, drawn-out process. He said, rather, it came like a little flower in spring. He basically um, had thought that, uh, you know, that it was time for a sort of uh, updating, as John would say, uh, a refreshment. The word he used was aggiornamento, which is really an updating. And he wanted to, as he said, throw open the windows of the church and let some fresh air in. And a lot of people were against that. Uh, cardinal Spellman, who was a very car uh, powerful cardinal in New York, wrote a letter to a friend saying about the new pope, how dare he call a council. Pope John is rash and impulsive. But John was very hopeful, and um, one of his opening messages to the, the, the Second Vatican Council was saying that, you know, from day to day he has to listen to all of these people who are sort of full of gloom and doom. And he says, I don't believe that at all. I believe the Holy Spirit is at work, and we need to sort of embrace the future. So he just wanted to update things, and uh, we're still seeing the effects of that council today. What most people would know, the Second Vatican Council for the best would be the uh, liturgy moving from Latin into the vernacular. So most people who speak English would have been able to see the, uh, the liturgy in English for the first time. Uh, there was a great emphasis on working with lay people. Um, the role of women was talked about. Um, the whole idea of the church, not as kind of a top-down thing, uh, where you have, you know, just the hierarchy and everybody else, but the church as the people of God, you know, was really talked about. And so much of this uh, came from John. John was the one who really helped um, sort of push people to look at these things at a time when a lot of people weren't ready to look at them. All Jesuit novices have to do a long retreat at some point during the novitiate, and that's a 30-day silent retreat. And I did mine at a Jesuit retreat house in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And one night when I should have been praying, I was poking around the library in the Jesuit retreat house, and I came across a book called The Wit and Wisdom of Pope John XXIII, which was kind of a surprise to me. I had already heard one of John XXIII's most famous jokes, um, which came when a journalist innocently asked the Pope, Your Holiness, how many people work in the Vatican? And John said, about half of them. I had heard that joke, but uh, there were so many wonderful stories in the book uh, that really drew me to John. He was a very funny guy. Um, one of my favorite was uh, when he was visiting a hospital in Rome called the Hospital of the Holy Spirit that is run by an order of sisters called the Order of the Holy Spirit. And he dropped by, and the sister who was in charge ran up to the Pope and said, Your Holiness, welcome. I am the superior of the Holy Spirit. And John said, well, I guess you outrank me. I'm only the vicar of Christ. So I think one thing that John does is just prove the stereotype that you have to be a kind of dour, grumpy person to be a saint. And he kept that sense of humor all throughout his life. At one point when he was the ambassador in France, he was sitting across at a dinner party um, from a woman with a lot of uh, low-cut uh, dress and a lot of cleavage showing. And uh, someone said to him, your eminence, aren't you upset that everyone is looking at that woman with the cleavage? And uh, John said, no one is looking at the woman with the cleavage. Everyone is looking at me to see if I am looking at the woman with the cleavage. At one point, a visitor to the Vatican who wasn't used to the schedule, the Italian schedule, the Roman schedule, said to John, I understand uh, that the offices are closed in the Vatican and people don't work in the afternoons, you know, because they take this sort of siesta. And John said, oh, no, no, he said, the offices are closed in the afternoon. People don't work in the mornings. At one point, John XXIII was walking through the streets of Rome, and a woman happened to see, catch sight of him right after the papal conclave, the election. 
And uh, he overheard her saying to her companion, my God, he's so fat. And John turned to her and said, Madam, I guess you know by now that the papal conclave is not exactly a beauty contest. So I think that one thing John does is disprove the stereotype of the cold, dour, depressed saint. Joy, as one spiritual writer wrote, is the surest sign of the Holy Spirit. And John shows us that uh, being holy also means being happy. I think we all know people who are very holy and very devout in their faith, and they're usually very joyful. And John, I think, shows us that in his life. One of the great things about John was his humility. Uh, and when he was very young, uh, perhaps four or five, he went to a um, religious procession in his town, and his father held him up on his shoulders for him to see uh, the passing procession. And he said that really the secret in life is that, to let yourself be carried by others to God. And when he was named Pope, and he was brought in on one of those big, uh, they're called sedan chairs that people carry on their shoulders, he was reminded of the time that his father carried him in on his shoulders. And he said, really, my whole life has been about letting other people carry me to God. I think the greatest thing about John really is his sense of humor and his sense of warmth. When he died, he was really mourned by everyone all over the world. And a friend of mine told a story of being in a cab in Rome uh, with a Jewish cab driver, and the cab driver was in tears uh, because he loved John so much. And my friend who was a Jesuit priest said, why are you crying? And he said he was our Pope too. John the 23rd shows us, I think, that it's okay to have a sense of humor. In fact, I think it's a requirement of the spiritual life. He was a joyful person. People were drawn to him, drawn to his sense of humor, drawn to his jokes. And so I always say John the 23rd's message for us is have a laugh for God's sake.